the Nile was always there. Long before Cairo, long before the tombs of kings, it was the reason for everything. It's a little hard to grasp how far this river's been flowing. This is the rain that fell on Abyssinia. These are the waters drained from central African lakes that have flowed 4,000 miles to make Egypt green. The Nile has its memories. The story of Khartoum is a recent one, less than a century old. That's yesterday in this part of the world. But however far back you may go, all the Nile's recollections have several things in common. There's always God, for instance, or if you prefer, the gods. It seems to have been quite impossible to live beside this river and not to have visions of eternity. And there's always mystery. You never quite know. You wind up with a few questions that no one can answer. One more thing. Why is it that everything was always so big, outsized, larger than life? Vanity? Perhaps. Or visions? Vanity was always mixed up with vision, and that's part of this story, too. But it's the Nile that remains the original fact. The Nile, and of course, the desert. Move up, up the Nile, leave Egypt behind and the Greenland, enter the Sudan, a million square miles of desert and scrub. It was here, out of the vast, hot African nowhere, that a man of the Nile, a man of vision and mystery and vanity, rose up in the 1880s to challenge first Egypt and then the world. He called himself the Mahdi, the expected one. And he gathered about him his desert tribesmen, and he cried out for holy war. Egypt hired an army of 10,000 men and a professional English soldier to command them, and sent them 1,600 miles up the Nile to Khartoum and on into the desert to destroy this man, the Mahdi. Our history might have taken a quite different turning had Colonel William Hicks not forgotten, if he ever knew, the Sudan's great fact, its immensity. The Mahdi led him on and on and on. <laughs> 